out of state. So thank you, Ken. Ken helps professionals around the world crush their fears of public speaking so they can focus on the important things in life. He has an MFA, is an award-winning actor, teacher, and speaker. He's spent his career as a teacher in one space or another. For nearly a decade, he worked as a theater and public speaking professor in Colorado and Illinois. Uh, since 2006, he's been in the corporate learning and development space as a trainer, facilitator, and leader. Kenneth holds an honors BA in theater sales and an MFA in classical acting. He's the founder of Kenneth Kendall Coaching, where he, as I said, helps professionals around the world crush their fear of public speaking so they can focus on the important things in life. Take it away, Ken. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. I hope you are all warm and safe. It's a crazy world out there. So let me start with a couple of questions. Uh, and by the way, this is gonna be interactive. So if you're on mute, I might ask you a few questions and then pipe up. Okay, all right. So how is your self-talk around your job hunt these days? What's going on in your head these days? What are you telling yourself about the job market right now? Do you find it thin? Do you think it's a great job market? What are you telling yourself? How do you see your chances realistically as a candidate out there in the world? Are you boosting yourself up or are you breaking yourself down? Where do you think you fall? What are you telling yourself about getting a new job? Okay, so why the heck am I asking you these questions? <laughs> what, a, what a weird way to start off a speech, right? So what we're gonna be focusing on today for the first part of our time together is your self-talk and the power of what you are saying in your own head. Because the self-talk that you have is the most powerful voice in your world. Let me throw out a couple of numbers here. So on average, your brain processes about 750 words per minute. Okay, that's a lot. Most people speak at about 150 words per minute, spoken, okay? So that leaves, when we are listening to someone, an extra 600 words per minute that are rattling around in your brain. That's your self-talk. And it is doing one of two things. It is either building you up or it is telling you that you are not good enough. So take a second and ask yourself, and this is rhetorical, I don't actually want you to you know, blurt it out here, but do you feel that your self-talk, especially around your job search, is positive or negative? Are you building yourself up? Are you, do you think that there are opportunities out there? Or are you breaking yourself down and saying, I am not good enough? I, there are people who are younger than me. There are people who are smarter than me. There are people more qualified. And let's face it, there aren't any jobs anyway. So where are you? So the reason we talk about this self-talk, besides the fact that it's the most powerful voice in your head, and that number 600 always scares me. By the way, that's running 24 hours a day. You're either breaking, breaking yourself down or lifting yourself up 24 hours a day. Super powerful. But when you are able to change your self-talk, the things you are saying about yourself to yourself, it changes two things in your world. Number one, it changes your behavior. And number two, it changes the behavior of others around you with whom you interact. So let's talk about how this changes your behavior. So th this, is not, this is not astrophysics here, okay? But one of the things your brain does is when you are creating a new habit, which all it is is, is neurons linked together. That's what a new habit is. Your self-talk is a habit, whether it's positive or negative, it's a habit. When you have a neural pathway, which is neurons holding hands, when you use it a lot, your brain wraps around it what is called myelin. That's a chemical that your brain produces. I will actually put that word in the chat because that's a fun word to know, myelin. So it's a chemical that your brain produces and what it does, it wraps around these neural pathways that you use a lot 
It insulates them from disruption. So think about myelin is that orange stuff that you get on the outside of extension cords, okay? So it insulates it from disruption. It sends a signal to your brain that when you have a decision to make, when you are, when you are faced with a decision to either go left or right, we're gonna choose the left because you myelinate that one more. Doesn't matter if it's good or bad for you, you've myelinated it. And third, it speeds up the, uh, the electricity that goes along that neural pathway. So it's the strongest, it's the preferred path, and it's the fastest. So why I'm bringing this up is when you have negative self-talk, what you are doing is you are myelinating this self-talk in your brain that is negative. Every time you put yourself down, every time you say, ugh, oh, I'm, I'm not even gonna apply to that job. I'm just, no, I'm just, no, I, I would never get it anyway. Your brain goes, cool, you're right. We're gonna go ahead and myelinate that for you. Good job, you would fail anyway. Or you say, I, I know I should network, but I, I'm not gonna meet the right person. Your brain goes, you're darn right you're not. <laughs> and it myelinates that. And every time you use that neural pathway, you wrap more myelin around it and it becomes stronger. And that's the preferred pathway. So what happens is when your brain starts to myelinate this, it starts to believe that as truth. Is everyone here, by the way, familiar with the concept of a self-fulfilling prophecy? Give me, give me some nods or raise of hands, self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, exactly. That's what this does. When you start to myelinate something in your brain, and so, so let's say, for example, um, you want to go to a networking event but you have a, you're not going to meet anybody there. It's not going to be good. It, these aren't the type of people you need to know to get your job. You walk in there and your brain goes, hey, remember that you're not good enough? Remember that? Let's make sure that happens. And it starts to sabotage, to make sure that what your brain believes is exactly what happens. And then at the end of the networking event, after you've had a terrible time and you haven't met anyone because your brain keeps sabotaging you, you get to the end of the evening and your brain goes, see, I told you, you're not good enough. And you myelinate it more and more and more. So it changes your behavior. You are actively seeking out things to validate what your brain believes. So it's not just a thought. It translates into action. So show of hands, how many of you want to sabotage your job search? <laughs> It seems like a silly question when we ask it, but that's what we're doing when we have these negative thoughts. So the other thing that myelination does, besides changing your own behavior as it starts to sabotage you, or by the way, if you have positive self-talk, it also makes sure that that happens. If you wanna to go to an event, a networking event, and you say, you know what? I'm gonna have a darn good time. I'm gonna meet like three new contacts and one of them is gonna help me find a job what is probably gonna happen? What do you think? You can unmute yourself and chime in. You'll meet new people because you're gonna go up to them. Exactly. <laughs> it seems so simple when we say it, but that's how it changes your behavior. And all you're doing is changing your self-talk. Your brain fills in the rest of the activity because it's looking for that self-fulfilling prophecy. If you are going into an interview and you're like, you know what, I'm just, I don't feel good. I'm gonna bomb this. I don't even know why I'm here. You will bomb it, 100%, 100%. But if you are telling yourself, you know what? I am good for this job. I'm gonna have a great interview. I'm gonna make a new connection. This is gonna be amazing. That's what's gonna happen. Is it gonna be the best interview in the world? Who knows? But you are setting yourself up for success when you have this positive self-talk going on in your head. One second, Ken. I see you have your hand raised. I don't know if that was to agree with something or if you have a question. Do you have a question, Tim? Tim, do you hear me? You can unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay, I just want, I saw a hand raised. Yep. So I just Tim, I, I saw your message. Thanks, ma'am. <laughs> so the other thing that this self-talk, either positive or negative, does is it influences the behavior of others around you. Think about that for a second. Your thoughts influence 
the people around you. Let that sink in for a second. How you are showing up in the world, if you are in a positive mindset, if you have positive self-talk, you think you are capable, you know that you are confident, you know that you are dang good at what you do, you're looking good, you're feeling good. Who cares if it's four degrees outside? I'm feeling good. I got my big coat on. By the way, I'm from the Midwest. We all have big coats. We know what those are. And I'm from Pennsylvania. So we had the big coat. I'm with you. But if you're walking around the world like that, people are going to see you and go, oh, oh, there is a confident person and I like what they're doing. I'm going to listen to them. If they want to come into an interview with that energy, I am going to believe that they are competent because they believe in themselves. Vice versa, if your self-talk is constantly bringing you down and you are walking around small and scared and not believing in yourself with your voice in your head saying, don't try. You know you're going to fail. Don't try. Just go be small. Go be in the corner. That's how you are going to present in the world and other people are going to see that and say, something's going on with that person. I need a confident person in this job. I need someone who believes in their skills. This is not that person. And they're going to react to you accordingly. Hey, one second, Ken. Dawn, yep. you wanted to give an example of uh, something that Ken was talking about. I don't know how long ago that yeah. was. Yeah, okay. yeah. so, so um, I recently started a position and it was a scam. So, how far you are from the... Sorry. I admitted him. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. So I um, recently, uh, you know, I'm a different person than I was 20 years ago. The old Dawn might have had these kind of doubts. The new Dawn is pretty confident. Um, I recently was offered a job opportunity um, and I, I showed, a, I let someone listen to the voicemail. I had doubts because of the, the voicemail was very soft spoken by the manager, but I felt like something was wrong. I almost blocked this person. Something just, there was nothing really wrong with the way he left the message, but something just hit me about it because I know how people leave messages. I'm in HR. Um, my husband, who's usually the Debbie Downer said, well, you know, when I said it's too good to be true, he says, how is it too good to be true? Um, and a coach that I know, uh, personally said to me, well, do you think you just don't deserve the job? Not that the job is too good to be true. So I went ahead and I took the position and after working 12 days, I found out I'm not being paid. It was a scam. I'm out $608 personally. Um, they tried to update their onboarding was so buttoned up better than I've seen in any company in the last 30 years. And they actually tried to open uh, credit cards and bank accounts in my name using my social security number, my address, my, my date of birth, um, all of my personal information. So I've been running around the last three days, actually since Friday, confronting them and going to the FBI and dealing with all of this. So sometimes, although, uh, Ken, sometimes, even though self-talk is very important, and I understand where we're going with this with confidence, but with more experienced job seekers, if you have a gut feeling, don't listen to others. Check it out yourself, because also the input I was, I was accepting from other people allowed me not to go with my gut, and I, this is, you know, I'm going to be 57 years old on Monday, just so, you know, I'm full, disclo full disclosure. And I have, I'm not, and I'm from New York, I'm from Brooklyn, and I live in New Jersey. I have never seen anything like this in my entire life. So that's just a word of wisdom for everybody. And, and they're preying on people in their 40s and their 50s who haven't been working during a pandemic that really, like us, that not everybody here, I mean, there's younger people here, but that need to, that need work and they're, they're preying on you. So that's all I'll say for now. No, Don, that's a very important point. Absolutely. There, there is a place for confidence. Never discount your gut feeling. Never. You have a hundred million receptors working in your body at any given time. Listen to them. 
Yes, exactly. Don, thank you for sharing. I am so sorry to hear that. That sucks. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm through it. I'm going through it, but it. But I know I know what to do because I'm very yeah. resourceful. But it's still, it's just a, a you know a warning for everyone else on this call. Yeah. No, that's a great one. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. So in that, yeah, I I can't stress that point enough. You're absolutely right. Confidence and pay attention to the world. Yeah. There's there's confidence and then there's false confidence. Make sure you are still existing within the realm of possibility and the reality of your world. Because yeah, there are, there are some disgusting people out there. Yeah, so thank you, Don. So, so far, and we're gonna talk in a minute how to actually change your self-talk, but is this making some sense so far? This idea of the impact of self-talk, either positive or negative? Okay, and I'm sure most of you have heard this before. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page before we start talking about how to change this and how to bring more confidence into your job search. And by the way, by the end of this, you are going to have some practical tips you can start using today, uh, especially on phone interviews and Zoom interviews, because we know that Zoom is the way of the future or the way of the present, either way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, let me, let me quickly introduce myself. Sharon did a great job, but my name is Kenny. Please call me Kenny. Kenneth is my uncle, after whom I'm named. I am not him. So call me Kenny. I do. I live in uh, in Springfield, Illinois, which was uh, where Abraham Lincoln lived before he became president. So we have all things Abraham Lincoln. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, I am Isn't a professional. Bart Simpson from there also. Uh, actually, they did a study, and I, I hate to say this, but they did a study looking at everything that's featured within the Simpsons world, and they think it's from Springfield, Missouri. I try. Because I think forty-eight of the fifty states have a Springfield. It's weird. Yeah, it's just one of those places. Including New Jersey. Including New Jersey. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, so I'm a professional actor by trade, but I have been a teacher for a very long time. And what I care about, uh, because I used to have really severe fear of public speaking and I had very low confidence, which is bad for an actor and a professor. But I had some very, very good coaches along the way who helped me. So this is how I give back to the world. I help people find their confidence and change their mindset so that they can go and focus on things like finding a job, being better at their job, being good with their family, whatever it is. And I work a lot with imposter syndrome as well. That's a, I've seen that happen a lot lately. So anyway, so that's me. But let's talk about how to change that self-talk, those 600 words that are constantly moving through your brain and myelinating every step of the way. So this is a three-step process, nice and easy. Step one, recognize the self-talk that you don't want. Recognize it, and it can be small, it can be big, it can be you wake up in the morning, you're like, ugh, I look like crap. Like, no, recognize it. That's tearing you down. Or you wake up in the morning, you're like, damn, I look good. That was a good self-talk. Recognize it. Step number two, and you're going to laugh at this, but I need you to do it. I want you, when you are in negative self-talk, what I want you to do is say out loud, stop. Say it out loud. It can be quiet because sometimes we're around other people. But say stop. This jars your brain a little bit and goes, oh, 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 okay, what's up? The third step is to then say what you want your self-talk to be. It's okay. And now, there is a catch on this one. What you do not want to do is, so, so let's say, you're, let's just use this example. Your self-talk is, I look bad today, okay? I think we've all been there at one point in our life. I look bad this morning. Instead of saying, I don't look bad this morning, because that's not helpful. Your brain will not hear the negative. What it will hear is, oh, oh, you, you look bad this morning. Okay, we're going to myelinate that a little bit more. That's good. That's good. Instead, change it to a positive. So moving from I look bad to I look amazing or dang, I look good. My silver hair looks fantastic today. 
So you change it to what you want it to be, but do not use the negative. Your brain does not recognize the negative. Question from Miriam. Yes, you say the positive out loud. It can be quiet because you're around other people, but you say it out loud. And you can repeat it a couple of times because what you wanna do is start myelinating this new path in your brain. So when your brain gets to that point, you look in the mirror and you're like, ooh, does your brain go, you look bad today? Or does your brain go, ooh, look, new myelin. Ooh, I have a choice now. Let's go over here. I look, I, I look good today. I look amazing. My teeth are sparkling. I have a question. Just, yeah. What, what if you don't believe it? I mean, you're looking ah. at me and you know, no, it's yeah. not, like, to me, and no, it's not true. So how do I say it and believe it and not have it be um, not true? Fantastic question. That was actually, if you could see my notes, that's the next thing on there. <laughs> Great question. Whether you believe it or not doesn't matter. It does not matter. Because, and this is the, Nancy's laughing. Nancy's been, with, been through this with me before. It doesn't matter because what you are doing while you are myelinating this, you are telling your brain, hey brain, this is real now. This is truth. This is what we believe. And once your brain has enough myelin around that and goes, oh, no, we look good today, your brain will then believe it. You don't have to believe it at first. You have to say the words. Okay. Yeah, because eventually your brain will believe it. And this is how we come to our beliefs in any part of our lives. This is how we learn any skill in our lives. It's repetition. When we were first learning to walk, you know there was a part of your brain that was just cheering you on. Otherwise, none of us would have walked. We'd hit the ground four times like, this is dumb. I'm not doing this. This, this is dumb. I'm just going to crawl. <laughs> your brain is wired for this positivity. You don't need to believe it at first. Amy Cuddy, uh, if any of you know Amy Cuddy, she's a Harvard professor, speaker, author. She's amazing. Love her to death. She has a mantra of fake it till you believe it. It's not fake it till you make it. It's fake it till you believe it. And that is powerful. There is a difference between faking it till you make it, and then you can stop. But fake it till you believe it, and you have rewired your brain. Self-talk is the same way. Believing in yourself. Learning a new skill. That's how we do all this. So great question, Diane. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, because then it's honest and I would do it. Otherwise, I, I would probably would say it's not true. I'm not, I don't believe it. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's what you would be myelinating. That's not true. Oh. Okay, that's thank you. Thank you, Diana. Good question. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, by the way, I'm not making this stuff up. Do I have my book here with me? No. I'm going to put a book title in the chat, which if you are into brain science, if you like just reading really good books, there is a book called The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle, C-O-Y-L-E. That's where this research comes from. So a little bit of backstory. Dan Coyle was a sport, is a sports writer, like Sports Illustrated, ESPN. He, you know, he writes for those. And back in the 90s, he kind of stumbled upon what he called hotspots. These are places around the world that were producing more top athletes than the rest of the world combined. And they were not where you'd expect. There was like this one janky tennis camp in the middle of nowhere, Russia, that was producing all of these tennis champs. I remember. This one soccer school in Brazil that was producing more soccer than anybody else. And he, he started to see these patterns. He's like, what is going on in janky Russia? So he would go to these places. And what they were doing is they were training their students to do exactly that three-step process that I taught you. When they started doing something incorrect, like let's take tennis, for example, if their swing wasn't perfect, the instructor would come over and stop them and they would fix the problem immediately. And then they would practice that perfect swing. And so by the time these tennis players got to the pros, they were perfect because they had been practicing perfectly for 15 years. But it's using this idea of recognize the bad behavior, stop, 
and then go the way you want to go. And it's all outlined in this book. It's a really good read. Um, if you don't care about the brain science, same author, there's a book called The Little Book of Talent, which doesn't dive into the science as much, but just talks about the lessons from the book. So both are very good. I'll give you a second to copy those down. All right. So that's the self-talk portion. So self-talk, 600 words a minute, rattling around in your brain, building yourself up or tearing yourself down. It is not only shaping your reality, but it is shaping how the world reacts to you. Incredibly powerful, just 600 words a minute, 24 hours a day. And you can change it. That's three-step process. Number one, recognize the behavior that you wanna change or the thought process that you wanna change. Number two, say stop. And if you wanna get really dramatic, like take a step back, but that's up to you. Step three is you then say or do what you want the activity or the self-talk to be. Not what you don't want it to be, what you do want it to be. Mitchell, thank you for putting that in there. Yes, Amy Cuddy. And I see that Anna, you have your hand raised. Do you have a question? I do, once I finally found the uh, the way to do that. <laughs> um, just uh, just a curious, I usually say to myself something, I, I, I'm like Diana, I can't really like completely, you know, Baloney, you know, give myself a load of baloney like that. But I'll say, hey, not the worst day. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and I'm very good at that. You know, I you know, it's finding the silver lining, which I'm very good at doing in every other circumstance. So why not for myself, right? Exactly. So what's so, getting in your way? Well, I'm asking if that would qualify. I mean, you know, maybe maybe uh, that would help. Diana and people like Diana, if that qualifies in your, you know. Uh... Yeah. So I would, I, I think the intention is correct. I love the idea of finding the silver linings. Absolutely. Because let's face it, sometimes your day sucks. Let's just call it what it is. Okay. <laughs> I'm not wearing my rose colored glasses today. Okay. Sometimes life sucks. But finding the silver lining is a skill. It is. And you have obviously, Anna, trained yourself to look for the good, right. but I would change the language just a teeny bit. So, so tell me again what you said, it's not the worst day ever? Well, I would say something like, not too shabby, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, all right, this is okay, I can do this. Yeah. So which, I would say do more of the second. feels much more positive than saying something that I don't believe, because yeah. that feels like I'm walking the world with rose colored glasses, and that yeah. does not make me feel good. Yeah. And so, yes, we were about to get into this. So let's actually go into it. Each one of you is going to have a different perspective on the world and kind of that threshold for, I believe these words, I'm not going to believe these words. And while I, while I was telling Diana, you don't have to believe it at first, it still needs to be within your realm of possibility. So yes, um, finding that silver lining and saying, this is, th this is a pretty good day. If you say something like, this is the most amazing day ever, and then you laugh at yourself, that's not helpful. <laughs> that's not helpful at all. So find your threshold. But here's my challenge to you, Anna. Find that threshold for you. So it's a, it's a pretty good day. Can you take it just one step higher and take it from pretty good day to this was a good day? It doesn't have to be great. It doesn't have to be spectacular, but just that one notch up. And that's gonna give your brain permission to go, oh, it's not just pretty good. We can actually have good, good days. I know it's a simple distinction, I know. But those words, if you repeat them long enough, those are super powerful. But Anna, that's a great question. Thank you so much. So yeah, find everyone, find your threshold of BS. And find out where your brain just starts to laugh at yourself. And it's different for everyone. And don't let anybody ever tell you, well, you should think this way. No. Find it for yourself. I'm just giving you some tools and some ideas. Find it for yourself. 
So great question, Anna. Thank you so much. Thank Good. You. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's move on a little bit. We're going to talk some more about Amy Cuddy. So I know a couple of you raised your hands that you would have known her, uh, known of her before. She wrote a book, it's on my bookshelf, called Presence by Amy Cuddy. I'm going to put this in the chat. She's got a TED talk. She's been at like Google talks. She's a Harvard professor. Very amazing. And she's got an amazing story. Um, and she talks about it in her TED talk. I won't bore you with it, but it's, it's fascinating. And have any of you seen her TED talk before? Amy Cuddy TED talk? Yeah. So interesting fact, the portion where she talks about her accident, completely unscripted. She wasn't going to include that. She just, she felt it in the moment. She's like, I need to tell this part of my story. And she just, oh. So, yeah. But what Amy Cuddy talks about in her talk and in her book, Presence, is that beyond self-talk, you can influence your confidence in how you walk through the world by changing your body and how physically you are showing up in the world. Um, now, Amy's research, because she was uh, at Harvard, she did have a little trouble uh, getting some independent review of her studies. Let me just say that 100%. And what she was trying to talk about has been verified by about 4,000 years of theater and public speaking and people that study this in other realms of the world. So, so thank you, Zahid, absolutely, yeah. But here's the idea. What you do with your body impacts your state of mind. What you do with your body impacts your state of mind, not the other way around. What you do with your body impacts your state of mind. Think about when kids first learn to walk. They fall down a heck of a lot, right? Always. When they fart, when they, when they first, when they first start walking and they hit the ground the first time, the first thing they do is not cry. The first thing they do is look to a parent. They say, my body has done this. How am I supposed to feel about this? If the parent freaks out, there is a link formed that when my body falls down, I freak out. I get scared. And there, that link is formed. On the other hand, if a parent doesn't freak out and goes, oh, you're okay, stand up and try again, the kid goes, oh, falling's down, not a big deal. All right, I'll just keep going. So this link is formed. Emotions happen after the body experiences something. That's how it works. Here's another way to think about it. We don't cry because we're sad. We are sad because we cry. Isn't and this it, has been verified over and over and over again. Nori, yes. Isn't it the same thing that they say when you smile, you, you should smile because your, you don't, your brain doesn't know if you really are happy. You should just yeah. smile and it'll, and you will be happy. You nailed it. Yes. By the way, this all, this all reminds me of Stuart Smalley. If anyone remembers Stuart Smalley, <laughs> looking mm -hmm. in the mirror and saying, I, I like I'm myself. smart enough people like me. It is a little Thank bit. You. He took it to the extreme because he didn't believe it. But the, they, were, they were mocking this kind of science. They were, absolutely. And, I'm, I'm, and Stuart Smalley is ha funny as heck. <laughs> but there is truth behind it. Excuse yeah. me, Ken. I, and I have to repeat this. Yeah, since we may have heard this is a classic Steve Martin. Humor itself, I think, is the idea of basically externalizing something that I guess catches someone aware. And, you know, the 600 words, like, take a break. What, what was that? What was it? And you said people asked me when he was early in his career, Steve, how come you're so damn funny? And I tell him, it's very easy, just one simple thing. Before I go on stage, I take my shoes off backstage, and in it I put in two slices of cheddar cheese in the bottom of each, you know, of, of each shoe. And then I put them on, and I go before the audience, and he says, and I, and I feel funny. <laughs> you know? Yep, absolutely. And actually, and actually, the humor is there's a lot of truth in that. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're external, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're setting yourself, you're doing the smile, and then you feel, I feel funny. He was just, you know, thank you. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I love that you know that reference. That's fantastic. I love Steve Martin. Heck of a banjo player. Good stuff. Yeah. So, so the idea, this is exactly what Steve Martin was doing. As funny as it seemed, but when you change your body, 
you are changing your state of mind. So what Amy Cuddy is talking about and researchers uh, that go along with that is before you go into a situation where you need to feel confident, before you go into the situation, and this is something you can and should practice before you need it. So this is going to be part of your homework. I'm a professor that I give everybody homework. The idea is find a stance, a pose that is larger for you than your normal standing around. So one of the ones, I'm going to move my camera here. One of the ones she really likes that makes her feel powerful is the Wonder Woman pose. That's just one. There's one um, that you can do like leaning over a desk. Right? If you've ever been on the subway, us on the subway and someone is man spreading, you know what I'm talking about. That's a power pose. Um, all the superheroes have them. All the superheroes have them. But the idea is that these poses intrinsically make us feel more confident. That's why the superheroes do them. And by the way, this was an interesting bit of uh, journalism that she did. She found a, a pose or a gesture that everyone on the planet does. When we celebrate, whether people are blind and have never seen this before, they've never seen this done, doesn't matter. When we celebrate, we go like this. Yes! <laughs> Arms go up. That is like one gesture that everybody on the planet, regardless of religion, background, and place in the world, that we do. It's fascinating. And do this and you can't help but get a little excited. And that's one of those links. You can't just do, yes. Even that, you're like, actually, I feel a little bit good about myself. I may have just won a participation ribbon, but I feel good about myself. So the, <laughs> oh, I got Carol to smile. All right. <laughs> Yay. So, so this is the work. And this is what Amy Cuddy asks of us. And what I'm going to ask you to do is every day for two minutes, just two minutes, Find a pose for yourself that makes you feel powerful and confident. This, by the way, should not be a like a realistic pose. You shouldn't just, you know, kind of stand there with your with your shoulders slightly back. This should be like a Greek or Roman statue. Big, throw your shoulders back. Make yourself take up space. When we are confident, we take up space. We are not apologizing for being on this planet. You gotta get big. So it doesn't need to be realistic. But what you do is you stand in this pose for two minutes every day. And what this does is it starts to build a link between this stance and the confidence that comes with it intrinsically. You cannot stand here and not have emotions or thoughts occur. That's not how we're built. Emotions of confidence and thoughts of confidence naturally fill in. Now, the first time you do it, the thoughts might be, I feel stupid. I look silly. And you know what? That's okay. But as you continue to do it, this will become a confidence pose. Now, I am gonna take this one step further because this is from my acting background. As you are doing this pose, which is going to be big, Greco-Roman architecture, big, 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 add into it something small. For example, and it doesn't have to be this, I'm just using this as an example, like take your thumb and your middle finger and just touch them. So it, it, it needs to just be small and look natural. So as, let me again move my camera here. So as you are doing your pose, like if your hands are on your hips, one of your hands is doing this and it's a part of it because here is how this is going to help you as you practice this for two minutes you're going to start to link this with confidence and this little gesture kind of like the quiet coyote from soul by the way i love that movie um, but this is part of it and over time as you practice this you start to diminish the time that you have to practice so you start at two minutes you do that for a while then it's like 1 30 and then one minute and then 30 seconds, and then 10 seconds, and then five seconds. And as you are diminishing the time, you are also diminishing the exaggeration you're doing physically. So ultimately, you can get to just this, and your brain goes, hey, that's our confidence pose. 
And you can do that as you're waiting to go into a job interview or a meeting or while you are in there. If your confidence starts to wane, pop in your confidence pumps. And it's gonna make you sit up. It's gonna give you that confidence. Your self-talk clicks back in to the fact that you're amazing and that you can do this. But you have to practice this. This isn't something that you just show up five minutes before an interview and go, okay, what was Kenny talking about? There was a, there was a, a power pose that I need to do. And then your brain's like, what are you doing? You look silly. And then you go in. You've got to practice this before you need it. So that's your homework. Find your pose. And you can watch Amy's TED Talk. She gives a lot of fantastic examples. You don't have to use the ones she gives you, but th they can spark an idea. The main point is you take up space. Be important. Take up space. Practice it. Make it smaller. And then use that gesture when you go into the room. And make you feel like a million bucks. I have a question, Sharon, here. Yeah. What if I'm going into an interview mm -hmm. and I want, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in there. Should I have my pose? Is there a special pose to be to be powerful or to be confident, even if I'm not feeling it? You yes. know, can, can you talk to that? To the, yeah. Tell me what you yeah, and Mitchell, I see your, your comment and Neil, I do too. Yes, absolutely. These are priming. It's priming, yeah. One, there are two things that can make you feel confident without having to do this huge pose. One is to stand up straight. Just have good posture. The second is to bring your shoulders back a little bit. Instead of standing like this, just bring your shoulders back. Can you see that difference? This with your shoulders forward, that shuts you down. With your shoulders back, it opens you up. And that is a sign to the world that you are confident. You are open to the world and you are ready. So those are two you can do at any point. When you go into an interview, don't apologize for who you are and for taking up space in this world. That's not who gets the job. They want the confident folks. So give yourself the benefit of good posture, shoulders back. Now, there is a difference between shoulders back and going like this. You don't <laughs> want to be like that person, like doing back stretches. Just back enough so it unlocks your power, unlocks your confidence. Great question, Sharon. Thank you. Does that answer what you're looking for? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Uh, any, anything you can tell us about what to do in an interview is great. So that was really great. Yeah. I mean, can you, what if you go in and you just want to look like, hey, I got this, and you just lean back in your chair or not good? No. Okay. No. Makes you look too casual and makes you look like you are not invested in the, in the opportunity. That's overconfidence. And that is a lack of caring. So great question. You wanna be engaged. You want to be straight on if possible with the person with whom you are interviewing. Um, this, this one may sound weird and Nancy, you know where I'm going with this. Make sure to blink. <laughs> Seriously, make sure to blink. This sounds weird, but we can forget to blink sometimes in interviews. Uh, anybody here ever seen the movie Silence of the Lambs? Yeah, okay. Go back and watch that movie. Hannibal Lecter doesn't blink. The actor, Anthony Hopkins, made a choice to never blink. It is creepy. <laughs> yeah. So some other ones. And Dean, you're absolutely right. I have a question. Do you have any recommendations? This is all great when you're walking into an interview and mm -hmm. you know your presence, but any any recommendations on how to sort of get the same effect while we're all sitting here in front of a blank computer screen. I mean, a flat computer screen and we're yes. doing interviews primarily on Zoom. Yep, I, I mean, do. I'm still sitting up, but anything in addition to that, that you yes. can help. We're, we're yeah. jumping ahead, but we're gonna do it. So okay. let's, let's talk to that, uh, Alyssa. Thank you so much. So number one, do your power pose. Do it before the interview. So, you know, let's say your interview is at nine o'clock. Do it at 8.30. Get yourself primed and ready. Um, you guys are going to yell at me for this. Make sure you're wearing pants. <laughs> Make sure that you are dressed for the part and wear shoes. 
I know you're like, I don't want to wear my shoes in my house. Wear shoes because it slightly changes your posture. There is a difference between not wearing shoes and wearing shoes. And people can see that. And it gives you confidence. Okay. When you are on a Zoom call, use the camera. So what I mean by that is imagine that your interviewer is in the camera. When you're looking at the camera, you're looking in their eyes. So you're not intense. You don't want to be like that. But imagine that you're, you're talking to the camera like they're a good friend. Keep it conversational. Um, re regardless of which platform you're using, Zoom, Google Meets, whatever, it doesn't matter. Make sure you are practicing on one of these platforms, which sounds silly, but make sure you know, you know, where's the mute button? Where's the video? How, check your outfit, check your lighting beforehand. And this is a big one. Make sure you don't have a cat um, filter on. Dang right. But that guy is <laughs> famous now. <laughs> or make sure you're not, you know, like a deputy director of the UN and your kid comes in. That's my favorite. But check that your clothes don't vibrate on camera. What I mean by that, if you have a, a shirt or a blouse or a coat that has like very fine patterning, especially if there are lines, um, they will look like they're slightly vibrating on camera. And it is annoying. It makes you, it just, it, it's terrible. So check that on one of these platforms ahead of time. Make sure you're okay. Now, during the interview, so we're already looking at the camera. I think mine is like a too, too much, yes? The stripes? Yes. Yours is vibrating a teeny bit. Yeah. Okay, good point. So, yeah, good, good question. Solid colors are fantastic. Um, and don't worry too much about your background unless it sucks. Uh, like <laughs> the, the room I'm in has a very plain background and I don't like it, I need to paint the room. So I just use this instead, but nobody cares if there's like a picture in your background. Make sure to hide anything that's not the best. Just saying. But when you're in the interview, so things to avoid. Wild gesturing. If you need to gesture, keep them low and keep them slow. Because this, the hand's just going all over the place. And I'm half Italian, so I have a problem with this. But keep your gestures low and slow and make sure they're not blocking your face or blocking the camera. Keep them low and slow. If you are a fidgeter, which you know who you are, get a pen or a pencil. I, I'm actually holding a pen, you can barely see it. And have a little notepad right beside you. And just doodle while you're doing it. I'm doing it right now. Can you tell I'm doodling? No. No, it takes out the nervous energy. The other thing to do while you are in the interview is to tell stories. Tell stories about yourself. So let's really talk about this. And Alyssa, I hope this is getting to the point of your question. Um, but let's talk about storytelling for a second. So in your interview, you're invariably going to get the question, so tell me about a time when... We all know those questions. So instead of the pat answers, and yeah, bubble wrap fidget toys are awesome, Nancy. Um, instead of just giving this long, rambling answer, let me give you a formula to tell a more effective story. And by the way, the reason that we tell stories and not just give facts is that stories are 22 times more memorable than facts alone. 22 times. So tell stories. And here's how you do it. And I will put these in the chat if this helps. So step one is tell the punchline early. Tell the punchline early of the story, okay? So if someone asks you, okay, what, tell me, what do you think your biggest failure was? Instead of setting the context and then going on this one and say, well, I'd say the biggest failure in, in personal and uh, recent memory is uh, when I completely botched the marketing for a professional development seminar uh, that our HR department was hosting. Like give them the answer right there. And then, so we have their attention now. They're like, oh, what happened? Then we're gonna fill it in. So it's like writing for a newspaper. You wanna get the good stuff above the fold, right? 
So tell the punchline earlier. Step number two is give the context. So tell me about how you ended up botching this so badly. What was going on? You know, so like, okay, so everything was going really well until everything was going wrong and then something worse happened. Whatever it is, but you're giving them some context. You know, it was, it was 1997. I was living in Jersey. We were at the convention center. I was in charge of this and we had all of it set up. And then this happened. So you're giving them some context. Step number three is to really introduce the challenge. Sorry, that's number three. <laughs> introduce the challenge. Okay. So for example, so you know, th this guy was was only in town for a few days, so I needed to get this event together really quickly. So there's the challenge. We had a small timeline. Instead of telling them I was working on something that had a very tight timeline. You tell him, this guy was in town for a few days and we had to get things moving because he had a flight out at 9 a.m. on Saturday. So I had to handle everything from finding a room that would accommodate this huge event to arranging for this hotel accommodations all within a few hours to make sure that the speaker was going to be comfortable so he could deliver that night. Now it's a narrative. They see you going through this process instead of telling them, I booked the hotel and there were problems. That's not interesting. So use a story. Step number four, describe your specific actions. If I could spell, that'd be even better. Describe your specific actions. So what did you do? And again, make it interesting, make it as part of the story. It's a narrative. So, for example, so, okay, so that's what I did, because it was my sole initiative to bring this speaker. I managed the entire process of handling speaker fees and other accommodations, as well as reserving the space in our office, ordering food for the event, coordinating the technology. I spoke about the event to everyone I saw and posted it on the company intranet board. That is so much more powerful than saying something dry and pedantic. And I coordinated all efforts and made sure that everyone in the company was aware of what was happening. Who cares? Tell me a story. Make yourself the hero. And then step number five is share the results. So you've already told them that it was a failure. And then you have built up the process. So now they're cheering for you. And then you remind them, okay, so unfortunately, the turnout for the event was terrible. I, I hadn't realized that in my previous company, um, you know, the only way to get people to come to HR events was to speak to the heads of the department. I didn't know that. So that isn't something that I did. But you talk about what led up to that. And yes, Amy, SOAR is, is also another way to look at that. Absolutely. Yeah. But why I like this just a teeny bit better than SOAR is it grabs their attention with how frank you are about the result. That gets them interested. Instead of them going to the situation first and they're like, what, why is this? Why, why are we going through this? Tell them what happened. Then we're going to give you the context. But there is nothing wrong with SOAR. Not a thing. So the reason I'm asking you to use these in your interviews is they are just more memorable. And there is something so much more powerful about telling a story around what you did rather than just telling some dry facts about what you did. I will forget the facts. I will. I will remember your story. And yes, facts tell, stories sell. We, by the way, don't make decisions based on facts. If any of you are familiar with Simon Sinek and his work, we don't make decisions based on facts. We make decisions based on emotions. Stories get to our emotions. They get us emotionally invested. Those are the people we want to hire, storytellers. Like look at all these amazing things that Amy did. Amy was that lady who admitted that she messed up, but then she learned from it. 
She told me what she did wrong and now she knows better. I want her. So I have a question. Yes, Taylor. What's a good way to practice this? <clears throat> Take your resume and go through things. I mean, how do you, so we have all the facts on our resume. So yeah. how do we practice changing that into a real story? So that, that is a fantastic question. So because I'm not a good storyteller or a joke. No, teller. that is not true. You are a good storyteller. You're just out of practice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No. And by the way, we, we as humans are storytellers, naturally. Um, but so, so let's talk about this. I had a practice. So yes, your resume probably is just a series of facts. What you want to do is before an interview, and I'd say start this today, is go through and look at those accomplishments that you have listed on there and write down the stories around them. Remember, you know, okay, so, so I put that I did this thing. Great. I rolled out a new, new platform. Fantastic. Okay, how did you do it? Who was involved? What did you learn? Talk about a timeline. Bring in characters. You know, in one of my last jobs, I brought on a learning management system. That's pretty dry. But if I can tell you about the six month planning process and the fact that I went ahead and interviewed all of these consultants and these development companies, and we ended up with this one from Fargo, North Dakota, because they did this, that, and the other thing that the others didn't. And then I brought them all in and we had these meetings. We had a whole structure set up. Blah, 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 blah. And the end result is we were two weeks early and $7 under budget. Hmm. That's a story versus I implemented an LMS. <laughs> Does that make some sense? But you have to practice. And there are some great resources out there, Diana, and this is for everyone. Look up storytelling structure. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. One of the most prevalent and one of the most powerful is what's called the hero's journey. Anybody familiar with this? Raise your hand, you all are. Oh, Anybody really? here ever watched Star Wars? Anybody here ever watched Lord of the Rings? Anybody watched a superhero movie? Anybody ever watched... Any movie that has someone overcoming odds. Yes, that's called the hero's journey. And I'm going to put a name here in the chat because this is something you need to know. Uh, the hero's journey. And it was really codified by Joseph Campbell. There is a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's a fantastic book. But if you've ever seen Star Wars or read the Iliad or the Odyssey or any of those old epic poems or you're a fan of science fiction, it doesn't matter. Star Wars, Star Trek, it's all the same stuff. What Joseph Campbell did, he was a comparative religion professor. He went around the world and he looked at all the religions of which we had a record and found their stories. And he found a couple of specific tropes that we have been telling since time immemorial. One of them is called the hero's journey. And the basic setup is like this. There is a normal person. Let's call him Luke Skywalker. Who is called to greatness. And he says, no. And then something bad happens. Like Luke's aunt and uncle being murdered. And then they say, okay, I will go on this journey, though I feel quite unprepared. And then a teacher shows up. Obi-Wan Kenobi. And then... There is a training period where young Luke Skywalker learns the ways of the Jedi and he realizes he's, he's part of a larger world than just his little slice of reality. And then there are obstacles to overcome. Luke gets better, he has some setbacks, he gets better, he has some setbacks, he gets better, he has some setbacks, and then he kills the big bad guy. Then, in the denouement, Luke goes back to where he started. And he becomes the teacher to the next generation of adventurers. That's the hero's journey. So when you are looking at telling your stories in interviews, you're the hero. You are learning. You are going up this ladder. And then, you know, the culmination of the project is that final step where you either won or you learned. Ah, you either win or you learn. How do you, Patrick, great question. How do you show or boost your energy level in the interview? Two ways, great question. Number one, do your power pose. Get your little 
I'm just going to call it my quiet coyote. Quiet coyote. The second is figure out and talk yourself into why do you actually want this job? What would be good about this? Not telling yourself that, you know, I am going to get it. It's going to be amazing. But look at him and say, would I have fun doing this job? Do I care? And then tell them that. Let them know that, listen, I, I would really enjoy doing this job. I love doing X, Y, Z. I think this would be amazing. Yeah. And there's a question that was put in the chat a while ago, so I need to help I didn't miss you. Is journaling, is journaling useful, given that it's usually not in the moment? Does that help anyway? So uh, I believe this is as we're talking about self-talk. Yes, journaling is useful. It is not as powerful as saying it out loud. But yes, journaling is powerful because you are still using your hand, and that becomes a myelinated platform within your brain. So yes. If you don't want to do the out loud stuff, do the journaling. It's a heck of a lot better than not doing it. So that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. All excuse right. Me, just, excuse me, Kenny. Yes. I just realized something. I mean, when you started talking, I figured, oh, why? God, they're not going to be any slides or whatever to capture. And how long is he going to be engaging? And, you know, and I realize, I realize suddenly that I'm watching a play and it's speaking to me. And unlike a play, a drama, where you're sort of focusing on the stage, I'm looking at the audience mm -hmm. and I'm getting input from the audience. And as opposed to a film, which when you think about it, is just a series of slides with, you know, commentary mm -hmm. that are just going by in a blur and you're not getting all of it. Yeah. You're making it interesting and you're telling us stories. And I realize that you're bringing to this, to the table so much more to essentially get the message across. In other words, we might not all want to go in theater. We might not all want to live in the Middle East, in the Midwest, but you're communicating that to us, and that's brilliant. The quick question, in yes. step number four of that, where it said, then you tell them what, describe your specific actions. As part of that story, have you heard instances where, you know, have to be done by Saturday, blah, 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 and so where the other character, you might be tweaking it a little, the other character in the story. So the guy says, um, that's great. What do you mean that great? Well, look what you did for me. You did blah, 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 blah. And this way in the story, it's not like I'm tooting my own horn. It's sort of the other, it's the other guy that's selling. And then you might end it up with, you know, the thing, you know, the fallacy things were improvement or whatever, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, okay, let's sum up here. I've done such and such. A. It's sort of keeping in context with the story. 100%, Elliot, 100%. And one of the things that communicates is that you are a gracious teammate without telling them, I am a gracious teammate. <laughs> like, really? Really? <laughs> you show them, this is what I did. I give this other person credit. They did this, this, that, and the other thing. And man, I couldn't have done it without them. They're like, oh my gosh, this person's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great point. Great point. Yeah. And it really is. The whole interview is you're telling a story about yourself. And you are bringing them along for the ride. So great observation. Yeah. So I know we are running out of time. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. So, um, and I know we're going to have a couple minutes for... Uh, for questions, but I wanted to really quickly, I, I got to tout my own wares for a second here. So what you guys just went through is the first session, um, for the most part, of a, a nine-week cohort that I run called Confidence Boost, uh, which is all about rebuilding your brain around confidence. And then we learn how to be a better public speaker and how to tell better stories. So it's nine weeks of that. And that's on my, uh, on my website. But I also do one-on-one uh, -on -one coachings with folks who have more specific needs. Uh, I'm helping a lady right now record her audiobook. I am helping a, uh, a woman who works at a, a big fintech company out on the West Coast with her imposter syndrome, even though she's a vice president. Um, I can help you if you want some more insights about your job search. I'm happy to help. And one thing that Meryl is, uh, or Sharon is going to put in there is I have set up for each of you a free 30 minute consultation. If you'd like to chat, if you have something that you want to work on, I'd love to chat with you. So that is gonna be in the chat. Uh, it's, it's free of charge. Partly, but I'm going to 
since you paused here, we're going to take a pause. Um, all those who've been on the programs before and new people, this is the point where we put the valuations out there. Uh, it's very important. I just uh, um, put the link into the chat box. It's critical that we have you complete these evaluations, cut and paste, or click on the link. I give a lot of feedback, specific feedback to the speakers, and it helps with our funders. So Sharon, you there somewhere? Can you time this? We'll give you about three minutes. Don't disappear. Ken's got lots more to do before we're done with our time, and we might even go over if we need to to answer questions, but I'm going to be quiet now and fill out the evaluation completely, and we'll see it. And don't come back. Don't go away. Three minutes. And time Okay. I, I'm timing it, and uh, Ken, you, you can go on as soon as we go off. I feel bad, like we interrupted you, but no, no, no. No, it was no, just no, a, stuff. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, that's three minutes. Okay, terrific. Where's our speaker? Oh, there he is. All right, Ken, the rest is up to you. Take it away. So I just wanted to open this up to any further questions, any help you can offer each other. Uh, so please raise your hand or shout it out. Bring it on. Ken, I have a question, if I may. Yes, Julie. Mm -hmm. So in your experience in acting, is what what advice would you give your younger self? Because I'm sure who you were is not who you are today. So what? And you may have you may have touched upon this in the last hour or so. But what advice would you give your younger self with regards to confidence and building uh, confidence? That is a fantastic question. Thank you. The advice I would give my younger self is don't listen to the naysayers. And two big ones come to mind. And I'm almost hesitant to say them, but one is my dad, who when I was in high school and I was headed into college in musical theater, he said, you had better have a backup plan because you're not gonna make it. And so I did. I wasted a lot of time in college taking courses that to be perfectly honest, I have never used. And I feel like I wasted my energy on that. Was what? 
across the country. Yeah. The, the second person was actually my high school no, theater what? teacher I wonder, who gave what? me a complex around my singing voice for about 15 years. Wow. When I was going to college, I said, I want to do, I want to do musical theater. I really love it. He said, Kenny, you can't sing. Just be an actor. Don't, don't audition to sing. And I ended up going to college on a musical theater scholarship, and that's what I did professionally. But to this day, I still hear his voice in my head, and he is living rent free. And I'm still working on that. But do yeah. not listen to your naysayers. They are not you. They don't know you. They know parts of you, but they are not, they don't know you, and the depths to which you are capable in this world. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Who else? There must be more questions out there. Um, I have a question again. Yeah. About the imposter syndrome. So mm -hmm. you present yourself, you're like believing yourself, you know what your skills are, but you still somehow feel like you get, and you get the job. So you get the mm -hmm. job and then all of a sudden it's like, can, can I actually do this? You know, I said I could, it's all on paper, but now what do I do? So I think a lot of interviews kind of ended that very scary part where you're trying to like say you want it but your brain is telling you oh you're an imposter you really can't do this so how do you what how do you deal with that two ways and that's a fantastic question i teach a whole seminar on this um number one is do it scared which is what we we tell my little kids do it scared does it scare you awesome do it scared okay do whatever. the second is something that sir richard branson always says. He says, if someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not qualified for it, accept the position and then learn how to do it. Okay. But you're never going to grow into a position if you are not giving yourself the opportunity to be challenged. That's the fun of it and the scary as heck part of it. But if you don't, if, if your imposter syndrome is telling you, you can't learn how to do this job, Okay, got it. You can't learn. You're, you're stuck. You're and you need to, yeah. Um, if you want to talk more about that, Diana, let me know. I've got lots and lots of resources on imposter syndrome. Because okay. one of the first things we do is start to look at which part of your imposter syndrome is true, which part of it is not, and which part of it is actually benefiting you. But thank you. Great question. Thank you. Who else? Questions, comments, anything? Ken, here's a question. Hey, Jim. Um, how about a few general tips on prepping for an interview? Just general, maybe four or five tips on interview preparation. Yeah. Or research and anything to help us, you know, become confident that that, that, that sense. Yeah. So the advice I would give is number one, take a look at the space that your prospective company occupies. What is their actual role in the world? What do they do? Um, I, I like to use the example of Coca-Cola. They produce snacks and drinks, but that's not what they do. Their whole mission statement is around entertainment and comfort. So figure out what space they are and what they're saying about themselves. Uh, number two, look at their mission statement and look at their cultural values. So you can see, first of all, do I align with those? Is this a company I want to work for? Because if I'm going to be, I'm going to hate it there. I don't want to do it. But you can also pepper some of those words in as you go. Uh, a third tip, always bring in questions that you have. Have a whole list of them. And number four is look up, and you all have this resource at your fingertips. What questions are they likely to ask? And start, don't come up with a script for how to answer them because that makes you look disingenuous, but write down a couple of bullet points. You know, so if they ask me, you know, what, what was the time that I failed in my career? Go through and just put out that, you know, those, those five steps. Well, here, here's, the, here's the, uh, the punchline. Here's what this was, here's what this was, here's what this was. So when you're in the interview, you can just look down at the bullet points. You're like, oh yeah, that's what I was gonna talk about. Um, and then practice the interview with someone else. If it's going to be a Zoom interview, get a buddy on Zoom and just go through it. Stand up, go through it, have, give them the questions and then get feedback afterwards. If you're not practicing, you are setting yourself up for failure when you actually get in the room. 
So practice it. And not, let me clarify, not that what you do in practice needs to be exactly what you're going to do, because obviously there's going to be different people involved. The situation is going to be slightly different. But the more you can get comfortable with giving the interview and being in front of the camera and, you know, using all the space and everything you do, the more confident you are going to be in that actual scenario, rather than discovering everything for the first time and go, wow, I look terrible. <laughs> I should have worn a different shirt. So does that uh, help you, Jim? Very much so. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. I have a question, Ken, yeah, sure. if I may again, it's Sharon. Can you hear me there? Yeah. So at JBS, we try to, Marilyn and I tell our uh, job seekers all the time, you, you have to network, you have to find people, you have to connect with people. But that's not the hard part. The hard part is how, and I would like your help and, uh, you know, with your answer, how to be confident enough once you connect with someone to say, hey, could we talk for five minutes? It's not good to say, could you give me a half hour or can we go get a cup of coffee? Say, hey, I'm only going to keep you five minutes. Can you can you talk to me? A lot of my job seekers say, I, I can't say that. I feel uncomfortable. It's rude. I don't even know these people. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can address that a bit. Absolutely. So I, I would say two things. Number one, uh, and I lost my job this summer. So I have been exactly where you guys are by the way, I should have told you that earlier. I have been unemployed in a permanent position since July. Uh, thanks, COVID, you're the best. What I found, especially on LinkedIn, is that once I started asking people for help, most of them said, why didn't you ask me sooner? Yep. People, especially on LinkedIn, want to help because 90% of them have been where you are. They want to help you. But if you don't ask, they don't know you need help. So that's the first one. People want to help you. Number two, imagine what's the worst thing that could happen. If you say, hey, could we, can I just borrow five minutes of your time? I have a question. The worst they can say is no. Okay. <laughs> Great. Then I move on. That did not ruin my life. You've never met this person. What bearing really does it have on the rest of your life? But most people will say, yeah, sure. Do you wanna make it 10 minutes? Do you wanna grab a virtual coffee? The other tip I would say is if you are really getting yourself riled up, you've written the, the message, you're like, I don't, I don't know if I can send this, I'm really nervous. Think about what would happen that night. Like get past this moment where you are terrified or you're afraid or you are hung up on your own thoughts and just skip to, okay, after I send this, I'm gonna go about my life. I'm, I'm gonna go have some lunch. I may take a walk or shovel some snow, have some tea. Later, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna watch my shows on Netflix. I'm gonna see what's going on with Mandalorian season three. But move past that in your mind. And that's gonna remind yourself that, oh, that, this right here, this feeling is not how I'm gonna be feeling for the rest of the day. This is a moment in time, that's all. And you know what? If I don't send it, I have missed an opportunity to connect with someone else. And that's on me. I can't get mad at them. It's on me. So does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. And you reach know, out to me. I'm happy to help. Reach out to me, Ken. I'll help you with your job search. Exactly. I actually got a job the other day, so I'm pretty happy. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Hi. Um, can I ask a quick question? This is Cynthia from Chicago. Heck yeah, Chicago. Represent Illinois. Um, <laughs> my question is, is similar to the, to the question, the sub, going back to the self-talk. Um, what I work in technology and I am several decades older than most of my coworkers. And I am always thinking about, I'm old, I'm old. I don't know how to use these technologies that they do. I'm not a digital native. How do I shut up that voice in my head or how do I convince that voice it's not true? Okay. So let me ask you the opposite question. What are you good at? What do you bring to the tech world table? Um, actually, kind of similar to you. I'm, I'm a storyteller. I work with content. Okay. So um, I can, you know, I can think holistically about how to how to make content um, 
show something effective for a client and change people's, hopefully change people's behavior? Yeah, that's ridiculously powerful. Mm -hmm. If you bring that to the table, if that's what you're leading with in an interview, you can get their attention. The other skills, Cynthia, yeah, you may not be a native, but you can learn them. Most recruiters, most, not all, most are looking to hire for fit rather than skill. If you can show that you have this holistic view and you have, to use your own language, decades more experience at storytelling than these young pups who can't get off their phones. <laughs> that's I think you had said it that you have to just be optimistic and, and positive. Forget about the fact of what you can't do. As you said it, it's what you can do. I think it was Merrill, Sharon, or one of these other programs that I've been on have always said, you know what, when you're sitting at an interview table and they say, what's your best feature? You know, don't say, I'm not really sure. I don't know how to do this, but I... You gotta be, you know, that, you know, the peppy person, regardless of that, that Nancy smile, wherever Nancy is on the screen there, you gotta be optimistic. You gotta be positive. And even if you're having the worst day out there, just like looking out my window right now is kind of like that, but I hear you. It's, it's a great, it's a great point. Well said. It is. So Cynthia, what part of Chicago do you live in? Um, I'm in Ravenswood on the North side. Yes. I lived in Andersonville for like five years. I hope you're a Cubs fan. Uh, you yeah. <laughs> But to be fair, I sang the national anthem at a White Sox game. Don't hurt me, okay? All right, thanks. Well, I like the White Sox. <laughs> I want to, um, as long as Ken is willing to stay, I definitely want to leave it for you more know? questions. But before more people disappear, and I see the numbers starting to go down, first of all, I want everybody in the room to give us a virtual thank you. Um, but an amazing presentation, Ken. It was fun. It was informative. I can see why you're an actor. Um, you just put so much life into everything you do. So I think that that really makes it easier for everybody, you know, just a read from the PowerPoint. You know, they felt like they were really here and present. And it was, in addition, it was just great information. I did put in the chat room the link to Ken's um, offer of a free consultation for 30 minutes. So go through the chat room and find that. And I was very amiss at the beginning of the program when I didn't thank our funders. We are fully funded by Jewish Federation of Greater Metro West. We could not do these programs or any of our services without them. And so we are so grateful for that money. And on top of that, there is a special grant from the Helen Kozlowski Foundation in memory of Helen Kozlowski that funds this program in particular. So we just wanna make sure you all know that this doesn't, it is for free, but it doesn't happen for free. And we do have wonderful funders. And then again, we are supported by viewers like you, as they say on PBS, um, not now, but someday when you will land and hopefully it'll be soon. And if you would like to give back and make a contribution to JVS to help people going forward who will then become unemployed and need our help, then that would greatly appreciate it. So again, Ken, this was just amazing and we're all very thankful, but there's still plenty, plenty of time for questions, Ken's available. So if anybody else has a question, there's a lot of stuff go popping into the chat box. So if you put something in the chat box and you want to mute yourself and ask the question, um, do that because before we get to see it, but go right ahead. But again, thank you for, and, and as Sharon and I always say, people are landing and people are landing in all age brackets, but most of our clients are 50 plus. So there are jobs out there. It's not easy. It's hard work, but that's what we're here to do at JVS is help you be the best job search you can be and stay motivated through the process. If you have any questions about anything related to JVS, I will pull my contact information in the chat box. Feel free to email me. I will get back to you as soon as I can and I'll explain what we do. So who else has more questions for Sharon? Ken, I have a question. Yes. For Ken. How do, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. How do you deal with the gap in your resume? Mm -hmm. So I think just be totally honest about it. And I know that sounds simple and pedantic, but tell them. Here's where there's a gap in the thing. I was, I was going back to school. I was being a stay-at-home parent. I was unemployed. There it is. If you don't make a big deal out of it, they won't either. Once they know that, oh, they were doing this thing. Okay, we're fine. Good times. Because many times what I find uh, recruiters say, but the, uh, the company is very picky and they want somebody with recent experience. Mm -hmm. So do you have recent experience? I do. Okay. But so what is, is that like, recent experience? My, the thing is I'm, I'm, I'm PMP certified and Scrum Master certified. Nice. So my license is current. 
Yep. And my, my my experience doesn't go away. Okay. So, but they just said they want recent experience. Yeah. So, so let me turn this question a little bit. Is in your gap, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how long it is. Was did you have an opportunity to use your PMP skills? Yes. Okay. Then talk about that. Perfect. Because then you're saying, look, I may not have had a formal job at this point. It doesn't mean I was idle. Mm -hmm. I was still doing this and the my skills, my PMP certification, my coaching, I was still using that. It just didn't have a job title behind it that I'm going to put on this resume. I was, mm -hmm. I was a mom or I was volunteering, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. give them absolutely no reason to hold that against you and turn that into a positive. Thank you so much. Yeah, great question. Thank you. I have one more question. Yeah, Diana, you're my favorite. Um, do, do you ever screen share during an interview? Like, would I put up a picture of, um, uh, I'm a musician, some of my yeah. former students, you know, either a video or this great picture of them happy playing or something like emotional or even just statistics that um, are, that might have been written on a paper, but should I do that during the interview itself? That is a really good question. And I don't have a fair answer to that. Um, we're on Zoom, it's a new kind of format. So maybe that's, gotcha. you know. I think you just have to feel out the situation. Um, I, one thing that popped into my mind is, do you have a, uh, a website or some sort of repository that maybe you can share with the interviewer and say, look, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. If you want to see pictures, if you want to see this, here, click on this link. You can do that after the interview. Um, but keep the focus on you. All right, that's a great idea. My brother has told me I should have a website <laughs> to send people for that, but I hadn't really connected the two. So that's a good way to do that. Because yeah. an in-person interview, I would be showing the pictures. I'd just bring them and say, hey, look at this, look at this, yeah. or, or listen to this clip, but now we're mm -hmm. not in person. So yeah. that's a good idea. You can even share that ahead of time. You say, no, hey, I just wanted to make you aware. I've got my website and it's got some reviews on there. Oh, yeah. You may want to take a look at that just so we have some context going in. Save you, the interviewer, some time. And then you're a hero. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Kenny, I have a, a question. Yes, Patrick. Is it, is it, isn't it true that, um, and this goes to the, you know, the question about ability, you know, you, you've gotten a job, now can I do it? Mm -hmm. That other people see things in you that you don't recognize so that uh, there's something about the way you're presenting yourself or whatever it happens to be where they say, this, this guy or gal fits, fits right in. I did an experiment once when I was working. I had the people who reported to me um, evaluate me with, without me in the room. Mm -hmm. and, and there was an HR person running the show. But the point was I found out interesting things about myself through this this process that I never would even have thought about. So I, I, I think other people see things that we, we ourselves don't see about ourselves. Couldn't agree more, Patrick. You're, you're absolutely right. And that's, yeah, our, our limited view of ourselves. We live with ourselves and our self-talk has said, we are this, we are not this, but we don't see the impact and we don't always see how we're moving in the world. We don't have that outside perspective. So yeah, and 360s are super valuable for that. Yeah. And it's interesting when we, when we coach people on interviewing skills, one of the things we tell them is to ask uh, former coworkers, former bosses to give you like three to five words that they would use to describe you. A, because sometimes they ask that question on the interview, but B, even if they don't, you can bring that up and say, hey, you know, um, one of the things I know is that my former boss described me with these words. So, and it's really interesting to ask that question of friends, of relatives, but people who've worked with you, who you can at that point say, hey, when I've asked this person this question, this is what they've said. And it's real data and it also makes you feel better. So that's well, great. Also data. in line with that, if I may, when you're trying to make that, that first impression when you walk in, tell me about yourself or whatever that is. I used to use a line that said, you know, um, I'd give a little 10 second elevator pitch, but then I'd throw in, I, I have two particular skills. One, I'm an excellent handholder, and two, I can herd cats. Now, and that's the reaction. What you just did is what I get from a lot of, uh, was getting from a lot of people. And that's the story they remember. Oh, you're the cat herder or the handholder. And that's how you make 
to me, that's how you make that image. That's fantastic, Patrick. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, a couple things. First, um, what Meryl, to what Meryl just said, sometimes I refer them to um, my LinkedIn where people, my recommendations, yep. because yep. I'll say, you know, so-and-so I worked with, actually, if you want to look, she said whatever it is. Um, yep. Also, as far as as far as what to say to somebody um, about your gap, I saw a cartoon that this past year you could say you were washing your hands. <laughs> That's what we've been doing for the past year. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and someone told me recently this was a suggestion because sometimes when you're reading a job description, it has so many. It, it's asking you for so much and such specific. Um, so many specific things that you're like, I don't know if I have all these. So she said to, in your mind, add to the end initials, like KK. In other words, they're looking for someone who has all of these things and their initials are KK. So Kenny, you'd be great for it. Yep. So just in your mind, I think it helps you feel a little bit, um, it, it, it helps you feel more like it's a little bit of a crapshoot sometimes what they're looking for. So if you don't get it, it's because you didn't have the right initials. That, absolutely. And my last thing is, because I asked Sharon, I actually have an interview in 20 minutes. So, so first, I'm going to have to get off quickly because I need to do my power pose, which was such Ooh. a good idea. But how do I look with my... Me and my lighting, especially right now. Folks, give her feedback. And this this isn't one of those, you know, I want the compliments. I just, I want to know for 20 awesome. minutes from now. Nori? Specific. Nori, yeah. tilt your computer up so we can see all of your head. Thank you. Actually, yes. actually, I've learned that you're supposed to tilt it down. Your head is cut off. Right. Yeah, I've the learned, doctor head is cut off. Right. Nori, your right, head I, is no, cut no, I, off. Do not I, go into the interview with your head cut off. I understand. I actually <laughs> learned that you're supposed to do that because partly it takes off some of the, the glare. Partly it I take up more of the screen versus... Oh, better. That's better. Uh, better. I, you, don't I, have to, you don't have to be that high. We can compromise, but your head needs to be seen. A little, little higher, just a oh. little bit. Okay. There you yeah, go. Right there. That's right it. There. Yeah. there you go. Okay. How's you that for to compromise? see your whole self, like your shoulder. Right. Just yes. your head. <laughs> right. I, I have an IMAX, so my, so it's like, unless I'm pulled, I have to kind of pull myself like <laughs> I'm under my desk, basically. So it's a little hard for me. To You're do. too close. Right. Where you were was fine. Right. That's right. a good spot. Don't move your computer. You got this. Nori, yeah. somebody also said that you have an empty plant thing on the floor that you should probably remove that we can see right behind you. There's an empty one. Oh, it actually has something, but it's very small. So <laughs> <laughs> that shows your it looks like it's empty. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been I wrote this in my um in my review, but this has been and I've been to a ton of these job seekers workshops. This has been the best, hands down. So thank you Good so, luck. so much. Good luck today. Nail it. You're going to get it. Good luck. It. I'm up to do my power pose. Yes. <laughs> Good luck, Nori. I'm sorry I can't see you. This is Sharon. I'm, there's something wrong with my computer. I can't see. That's you. okay. I just asked, okay. I asked the masses. So. Yeah. Yes. Good <laughs> Nori. In two weeks awesome. now at our next program, we're going to announce about your, you know, Landing, so there we go, right? Sounds good. It's gonna be positive. All right, thanks. Any other quick questions? For me? Like, yes, hi, it's Leo. I have a question. Hi. What do you do when both you and your job work search uh, buddy got into a funk and you're not really motivated? You lost your motivation. Just a series of bad things have happened. Mm -hmm. How do you get yourself back mo to be motivated again? Fantastic question. So what I've done in the past and what some of my clients have done in the past is, and, and go with me on this one, for one day, completely change up your routine in life. Just mess it all up. Go, you know, if you wake up at nine o'clock, wake up at seven. 
If you're a coffee drinker, drink some tea. Although I'm not giving up my coffee. Don't you ever ask me to do that. Um, you know, if you like to stay inside, go for a walk. If you like to listen to a certain kind of music, listen to a different kind. Put on some Taylor Swift. You do that. But the idea is you are breaking that pattern of funk because it's something that you've learned. You've been myelinating it. Aha, see back at the beginning. What you need to do is break yourself out of that routine for a day. And hopefully, and it may be two days. It depends on the person and how deep the funk is. And then on the second or third day, refocus yourself on why you're looking for a job, what kind you're looking for, and what life is going to look like when you achieve that dream job. Then go back into the job search with more clarity. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great question, Leora. Any other questions? Yes, this is Penny. I have a question. I did one in the chat, but I'll just do it real quickly. Um, Ken, I'm looking to make a career change from finance into HR. And I'm in the path of doing a lot of um, informational interviews, but it's sort of new to me and I'm sort of out of my comfort zone. So I just wanted to find out what would be a good um, sources to view in terms of uh, networking and asking critical um, information interview questions in order to get um, sort of succinct of what I'm looking for so I can um, just go down the right journey. Fantastic question. And good for you for switching careers. That's terrifying and exciting all at the same time. It is. <laughs> um, so I would recommend a couple of things. So I'm from the HR world. I was in HR for five years. So first of all, why do you want to switch to HR? Um, I was asked that question before um, because I, it's not so much I enjoy, uh, well, I should say enjoy helping people. It's just that I, I find a more of a comfort in, in um, doing HR functions than I did um, when I was in uh, finance. And it seemed like I had a polling to do something like that, but I wasn't quite sure to, you know, when and how to make the jump. So I, I feel now since I've been employed for a little while, I had to do elder care um, for a little while that, that now's the time to actually do it. Gotcha. So, um, so yeah, I, I wanted to make that career switch and um, I've been talking to some HR people, but I just wanted to know, um, you know, again, if there was some source information that you could provide that would be a good um, tool for me to use. Um, yes. And I, I did, um, I see your, your, your stuff in chat. I did uh, go through that organization, but I was told you need experience before you can get the certification. You do, but they still have really good information and articles on there. So it's a magazine. Okay. Um, I would also suggest utilize LinkedIn. And there are HR specific groups that exist within LinkedIn. Start to follow them and start connecting with people and asking questions. Um, I'm actually going to give you, so you can, you can connect with me. Okay. I can answer some questions. Um, I would, I'm also gonna type in a, uh, one other name. Uh, her name is Rachel Bollinger. She's a colleague of mine. She, she's been in HR for a long time now and she would be a really good resource. She posts really good stuff on her LinkedIn page anyway about HR. Okay. Uh, reach out. Um, and search for people that have the job title that you're looking for. Okay. And engage in conversation. Start to follow their stuff and send them a quick note and say, hey, my name's Penny. I'm trying to make a career switch. Your job is the kind of job I'm looking for. Can I borrow five minutes of your time? I'm new at this. <laughs> okay. That's great. That's really okay. great. <laughs> Good luck. That's exciting. Hi, Jim. And one more question. Is it okay to take notes during a video interview? Yes. As a panel that situation? Yes. So what I would recommend is this is, again, something you need to practice so you kind of know the confines of, of your Zoom here. Get yourself, so I've got my papers, which you can't see, but they blocked me out here. Hold them so they are just below where the camera picks up. It's like right there is where they pick up. So practice having them down here so you can take notes with your eyes down here rather than going like this. Uh, or have them off, you know, kind of to the side here. What you want to avoid when you're taking notes is blocking yourself off from the camera. 
And another step that I found that's helpful is let them know at the beginning to say, hey, this is really important to me. I'm going to be taking some notes if that's okay with you. I just want to make sure that I'm capturing everything we're talking about. And they'll probably say, damn, that Jim is, he is on it. Yeah, take notes, please. Yeah, great, yeah, right. yeah. great thanks. Good points. Excellent. Okay, I think that now that we've gone 20 minutes over the time that we should let our speaker go. I want to thank you again, Ken, for volunteering your time to do this program. It's been amazing. And I, I know I've learned a lot. I've been motivated. It's been energizing. And I'm sure everybody else here as well has felt that way. Stay tuned. Two weeks from now, we have a great program. We have a speaker coming back, David Schumann, but he's doing a different topic and it's going to be terrific. And, and hopefully... Half of you won't come back because you've landed jobs. That's the best news. If you do land something, please share it with us because we love hearing happy news. In the meantime, those of you in the tri-state area, be careful today, stay home. Not that we're all going any place anyway. Um, and just look out the window, say pretty snow, go away. And just stay healthy and warm and safe. And um, if you need any help, go back to the chat. There's lots of great information in there. And we just wish you a good day and a great weekend. So thank you again, Ken. Everyone, thank you. Buddy, take thank care. you, Ken. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.